as we prepare to hear the word of God proclaimed. Let us pray for illumination. Holy One, guide us by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover peace. Through Christ the Saving One. Amen. Our first scripture reading comes from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 1. A leper came to him, beg <clears throat> begging him, and kneeling, he said to him, If you choose, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, and said to him, I do choose, be made clean. Immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. After sternly warning him, he sent him away at once, saying to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded as a testimony to them. <clears throat> but he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the words so that Jesus could no longer go into a town openly but stayed out in the country, and people came to him from every quarter. Our second reading also comes from Mark, chapter 4. He said to them, Is a lamp brought in to be put under the bushel basket or under the bed and not on the lampstand? For there is nothing hidden except to be disclosed, nor is anything secret except to come to light. Let anyone with ears to hear listen. And he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. The measure you give will be the measure you get, and still more will be given to you. For to those who have, more will be given, and from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. The Gospel of the Lord. Will you join me in prayer? Startle us, O oh God, with your truth, with the challenges of your word, with the new things we find in it that we did not see before. Open us to your love that we find here in your house and are called to take to others as often as we meet them. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, may they be acceptable in your sight. For you, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I have lived in Cincinnati for a little over seven years, and in that time I have formed the opinion that, that Cincinnati is a well-kept secret. People love it here for lots of good reasons. In every city and town across our country, there are parents who wish that their adult children were more eager to move home or live closer to home. That happens here too. But I am routinely impressed by the bright young people who stay close to home for college or move back as young adults. Cincinnati is where they want to raise their children. It doesn't happen all the time, but it happens a lot. At the same time, Cincinnati is not a place that always does a good job of showing off what a great place this is. Corporate recruiters and politicians talk about this, the need to do a better job of selling the city. I had my own experience of this. A couple of years ago, I hosted a national conference here in Cincinnati. It was a bit of a challenge to get people to sign up. I did get them to come, and then I was routinely approached by friends from around the country who said to me how surprised they were that they really liked it here. And then there are little idiosyncrasies about this town, all kinds of little secrets 
some of which deserve to be told more widely, some of which maybe don't. I'll be honest with you, as someone who was not born and raised here, I can attest to you that beyond the metro area of Cincinnati, no one really cares about the chili. (laughs) I know, I know, but it's important as your preacher that I speak truth to you, even about things that are hard. So no one really cares about the chili, but then there's Geta. Oh, sweet Geta. If you read the transcript of this sermon, you will see that I capitalized it. Fried, crispy on the outside, melty perfection on the inside, perfect for those who love something savory with a, an egg yolk that's all runny, or for people who like something sweet with a dollop of maple syrup. I went on a trip not long ago with some other pastors from around the country. I was in charge of breakfast, and I tell you, when I served Geta to these unsuspecting friends, they said, as I knew that they would, how are you Cincinnati people keeping this a secret? It's good stuff. Now, by now, you're wondering, what does this have to do with anything? What could this sermon possibly be about? Well, I would suggest that in some ways, Knox Presbyterian Church is a well-kept secret. This congregation has a sort of classically Cincinnati way of not talking about itself very much. I want to spend some time with that idea this morning, but I also want to go deeper than that and share with you what Jesus says in the Gospel about secrets. You may not have paid attention before, but Jesus' ministry was a well-kept secret, or at least he meant for it to be. Dozens of times Jesus tells people after performing a miracle or with reference to his identity, he says, tell no one of this. Tell no one of this. In the Gospel according to Mark, he does this in chapters 1, 3, 4, 8, 9, and 11. In Matthew, it comes up in chapters 8, 9, 16, 17, and 21. Luke talks about it in chapters 4, 5, 8, 9, and 20. And John does it in his own way in chapter 2. This is not an exhaustive list. You get the point. This kind of secrecy seemed to be important to Jesus. Why? Well, it happens often enough that theologians have studied this, and they have a name for it, as a matter of fact. They call it the messianic secret. Jesus wanted to keep it a secret that he was the Messiah. The consensus view is that Jesus was protective of his identity. He kept secret the miraculous acts he was performing, and as well as his identity, because he did not want to be misunderstood. He did not want to be misunderstood. The ancient world was full of fame-seeking faith healers, charlatans who were trying to make a buck by tricking people. Jesus did not want to be lumped in with that group. Aside from the miraculous things he did, Jesus also wanted to keep keep it a secret who he was. Jesus was not the first person to be referred to as Christ or Messiah. The Jewish people looked to many possible saviors in their history. Most of those saviors who came before him had a plan for military rebellion against the oppressive Roman Empire. Jesus had a different kind of kingdom in mind, one that we strive toward through peaceful conquest of hearts and minds, not a simple replacement of one violent king with another. Jesus wanted his his identity as a Messiah kept a secret so that people wouldn't be waiting for him to show up with a sword and an army, which he had no intention of doing. The funny thing about Jesus' big secret, this messianic secret, is that the word got out anyway. 
The word got out anyway. Perhaps the most famous example of this is the resurrection story as it is told in Mark chapter 16. When the women appear on Easter morning and they find the tomb empty, Mark tells his readers that the women fled from the tomb and told no one what they had seen, for they were afraid. Well, obviously they told someone. The word got out about Jesus. Otherwise, what are you and I doing here in church today? The same thing is true of the story from Mark 1 we read this morning. Jesus heals a leper who comes to him begging to be made clean. As soon as the man is made well, it says that Jesus sent him away at once, saying to him, see that you say nothing to anyone. Then a few verses later, Mark admits, but the man went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the word so that Jesus could no longer go into a town openly, but stayed out in the country. And people came to him from every quarter. Jesus tries to keep the healing a secret, but the man who was made well just could not contain his joy. He went out spreading the word about Jesus. Jesus himself seemed to have some ambivalence about this messianic secret, and we see that portrayed in the second lesson you heard this morning. In Mark chapter 4, Jesus says to his disciples, Is a lamp brought in to be put under the bushel basket or under the bed and not on the lampstand? For there is nothing hidden except to be disclosed, nor is anything secret except to come to light. Jesus seemed to know that secrets have a way of coming out in their own time. Even if he was afraid people would misunderstand him, Jesus seemed to understand that his secret was going to get out. Light is meant to shine, and good news is meant to be shared. It's a good challenge for congregations like ours, where we don't talk that often about sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, we don't spend much time equipping one another to talk to friends and neighbors about Jesus. It's my hunch that many of us aren't comfortable doing that. It's other Christians, we think, a different kind of church people who approach their coworkers and their neighbors and strangers at social gatherings and talk to them about Jesus. That kind of high-pressure sales pitch just isn't the Knox way. The irony is that we have the opposite problem from what Jesus suggests in today's scriptures. I trust that most of you are here this morning listening to this sermon, uh, worshiping with us, because you like Knox. You think what goes on here is good news and that it probably should be shared. And no one is telling you to keep it as a secret. We're just not used to running out the doors to tell the first person we see. This fall, I'm going to be talking to you in a few of my sermons about letting your light shine. Following Jesus' directive to stop putting our light under a bushel basket and instead put it on the lampstand so that people can see it. For some of us, this is unfamiliar territory. It also may not feel like the humility to which we are called as Christians. And yet, I invite you to think about it from another perspective. Is it not selfish to enjoy the good news of Jesus Christ in your own life, but not to tell others about it? But how do we do that? How do we do that? What for this community would be the most authentic way of letting our light shine? At this point, it might be helpful to think about some of the great things about our congregation that we may take for granted. Think about the getta of our Christian life together that is just plain selfish for us to keep 
to ourselves. Imagine a favorite gathering that you enjoy here at Knox, a, a study group or a committee or a singing group or a fellowship gathering that you are a part of, and ask how long it has been since you intentionally invited someone to join you. Think about how much you appreciate the relationships you have here at Knox, the experience that you enjoy here on a Sunday morning. How long has it been since you invited someone to join you for worship? How often are you intentional about seeking out someone you do not know on Sunday and introducing them to your friends? It is so easy to enjoy seeing your friends on Sunday morning, and that's absolutely something we should do. I want to make it a point to say that I've met at least half a dozen people today who are here for the first time, and I hope that you'll seek them out after worship. It's so easy to enjoy the things that we are used to. How are we letting our light shine before others? Think about this space, the space, the property that we care for here, the indoor and the outdoor blessing that we have of Knox Presbyterian Church, the place. Think about what it means to you. Last year when we are, were closed for so long, I had more than a few experiences of people re-entering this space and tearing up because they had missed it so much. What does our church look like to people who are not part of our congregation? When they walk by, what do the closed doors and uh, the imposing facade suggest? How do we make the place more welcoming? How do we catch passers-by as they head to the farmer's market? How do we share with them what is so special to us so that we might be us together? Here's one of my favorite things about this congregation, one of my favorite things about being your pastor. I love Knox Presbyterian Church for its comfort with doubt. It's comfort with doubt. Many preachers are afraid to express doubts in their sermons, afraid that congregations will run them out as heretics. You allow me to explore real interesting questions about the mysteries and the inconsistencies of our faith. Do we celebrate that gift often enough? Do I rejoice in it often enough? Do I give other people permission to ask the real hard questions of faith as often as I should? Do we do that when we're trying to make sense of suffering and grief or make sense of the doctrines that have been handed down to us from long ago? When we find friends and loved ones who are struggling in their own lives, do we take that opportunity for evangelism? to tell people that we are part of a congregation where big questions and honest doubts can find a home. Do we do that? During this service today, after the sermon, we will be ordaining a new deacon and a new elder, people who were unable to be here in person with the rest of their class when they were ordained. It may surprise you in light of this sermon topic that I'm going to ask them to say yes to a lengthy set of questions about doctrine. So let me tell you what I believe about these questions. In officer training, which all of our elders and deacons are required to attend, we talk about these questions. And I make it a point to say to each new class of elders and deacons, that these questions are not being asked of them in the hope of a passive, thoughtless, nodding response, but with the hope that they will actually think about them now and many times in the future, that they will allow these questions to work on them. I believe faithful people should ask what they really believe about the authority of Scripture in their lives or what it means to call Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior and to place your trust in him. 
Going all the way back to John Calvin, it is an accepted tenet of Reformed Presbyterian belief that an engaged faith involves having some doubts. And allowing these doubts to do their work in your life is an important part of growing in your faith. It is important to give voice to doubts and not to hide them in secret under a bushel. Later this year, I will be preaching a bit more about the things I've been talking about this morning, letting your light shine and giving light to our doubts. As I prepare for those sermons, I hope you will help me to think about our life together, about how we are letting our light shine and how we're exploring together the things we may not be so sure about. I hope you'll share with me where you would like for us to go deeper on these questions in our worship and our study together. It may be different than what we're used to, but let's try not to keep these conversations to ourselves. Let's let our light shine. Amen.